we were so fortunate here to have this very long interaction between you and cultural landscape and that at its best is also a, a very rich natural but very rich landscape for nature and biodiversity and this book started a national movement called common ground which is still going so where are we now um, well so John Lawton uh, led a review for government uh, 10 years ago or just over 10 years ago now 12 years ago and uh, said, right, we're in pretty dire straits. Um, we've really got to do something about this. And he came up with, his panel came up with a mantra to make uh, wildlife habitat bigger, better, and more joined up. And he was asked to do a, he, he himself did a stock take 10 years later. And on the basis of that, wrote to the then Prime Minister, um, Sir John Lawton. Nearly half of our species are in decline, a quarter of our mammals are threatened with national extinction, etc. But even more important, uh, there are too few places left where a child can walk through a cloud of butterflies or see them on the rainbow of flowers. Well, here are two children, in fact, my grandchildren, uh, with um, amongst a, 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 a wildflower meadow. And uh, amazingly, this is in Wilmslow. So this is a fairly dismal kind of picture I've been painting, but where does Wilmsle and its countryside sit in all of this? Well, we've got kind of lots of evidence to go on, not so much about change through time, but about where we sit in relation to the county Cheshire in which we, we reside. And this, this will surprise you. Uh, uh, biological recorders record uh, wildlife uh, whether they're looking at insects or, or, or birds or plants in things called tetras, which are four kilometer square units. And in Alan Newton's flora of Cheshire, there are five uh, tetras in the whole of Cheshire with more than 400 plant species. Two of those are where we are now, immediately adjoining each other. And, uh, uh, and uh, there are 450 plant species in our immediate area, and nowhere else in Cheshire comes near it. Um, the same is true for birds and butterflies, we're in the Premier League, if not at the top. Why on earth is that? The reason for that is because of the landscape diversity which we enjoy here. Um, and this is uh, from the landscape character assessment that we carried out to underpin the Wilmslow neighborhood plan. So, uh, you've got the urban area through here, uh, with uh, Wilmslow here and Hanford. We then have uh, the <coughs> river valleys which are coming through. So we've got the Bollet coming through. And you see there is an ecological corridor even going right through the heart of Wilmslow itself. And the same is true of the uh, Dean as it comes uh, through Handful. There's a splendid ecological corridor going through there. Sometimes on the railway line, you get a glimpse of this, and it's quite exciting. It's even more exciting to kind of hack your way through when you find yourself in this amazing sort of world inhabited clearly by teenagers, getting up to all kinds of things. But wildlife enjoys it as well. Uh, and then we have uh, then we have uh, pastoral farm. Sorry, we have. Whoops. Uh, 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 sorry. Uh, yeah. um, Technology is a wonderful thing. It just is. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, that's all right. Thank sorry. you. Oh, oh, that's it. That's great. Okay, that's, that's lovely. So, uh, so we've got we've got the river valleys. We've got pastoral farmland that is shown here in yellow, and we've got moss land which is in purple. And we'll just very quickly uh, look at something there. So I talked about the the dean, uh, the dean coming through here, and the bollet coming through here. Um, and uh, when I came to live in Wilmslow 45 years ago. Uh, 
uh, our river bolling was virtually uh, biologically dead. I mean, you know, there were there were a few sort of pollution resistant invertebrates, and that was about it. Um, in 1985, Michael Hesseltine initiated the Mersey Basin campaign, which was a major campaign to bring fish back to the uh, Mersey and its and its tributaries, uh, and that of course required massive water quality improvement. And thanks to that being backed by European Union directives on water quality, by 2001, we had Atlantic salmon back in the Mersey, which was astonishing. And they got via actually the ship canal into the Bolin, got right to here. And um, beyond, beyond here, just upstream on the other side of Wilslow, there are uh, wonderful. Uh, uh, Riffles and gravel beds, ideal spawning grounds for salmon, but can they get there? This is the huge weir at Quarrybank Mill, and so the installation of the fish pass and hydro pass scheme by the National Trust has been incredibly beneficial in overcoming that. And uh, the, next, the next barrier, not so formidable really, is this one, which is the town weir in, in Wilmslow Park, um, just the other, other side of other side of Wilslow, but you have a series of weirs between here and the Mersey, and they have all, up to this point, the fish pass has all been facilitated. And in, uh, in uh, the centre of Wilmslow, we have this wonderful park, the Wilmslow Cars, where we've got again great diversity of landscape and therefore great diversity of nature. And the um, ANSA, who managed this for the local authority, have recently started to oops, um, <laughs> have recently started to relax the mowing. So this is the this is the upper flood terrace in Wilmslow Cars, and I always thought there was something special here. When they relaxed the mowing, we suddenly found we had this wonderful meadow with plants like bulbous buttercup, which I'd never seen before in the north of England. And this, this meadow is an absolute classic example of the kind of meadows that we've lost on our farmland. And it has been preserved in aspic by gang mowing for decades. And as soon as that was relaxed, you've got this glorious flowering. And uh, it's really quite remarkable. Very often, when we find these here, these meadows are on medieval flower lines. And to our amazement, when we looked at this in the winter, having seen it in all its glory in the summer, we saw that indeed this was a, a corrugated landscape and that this meadow was sitting on, on medieval flower lines. And that's in the middle of an urban park. Sort of drew me in when I first came here because um, the, the brief for the commission that I did was to connect the Industrial Revolution um, with the current climate emergency, to think about how, how much is the climate emergency an unintended consequence of the Industrial Revolution to make those connections. And that's kind of huge. It's always too big to think about. There's so many connections and it's so, so many complicated connections that we really wanted to root it into the landscape here. And this particular tree was kind of my way in as an artist to thinking about this. So it's the Great Beach Tree. People say that it is, is at least 250 years old, so it's likely that it was there. There's a much smaller, probably insignificant looking tree, but it was likely it was there when this mill was built, um, when Simon Simon Graf first came here um, in 1784. And the idea that that tree has sort of witnessed all of these landscape changes, it's, it's been there for every single flight that has taken off and arrived at Manchester Airport. It's been there for the whole life of this mill. Um, and all any atmospheric um, pollution that might have kind of might have absorbed. It's been here through all of the agricultural changes in the fields. So on the maps of this area, when the mill was first built, you can see the different field uses, <laughs> things like clover fields, um, different fields that, that are being um, left in different states to help be raised <coughs> before presumably crops are kind of rotated around. And the tr this tree must have been there. So uh, right through to kind of modern agriculture and then through to what John was talking about in terms of the um, re, um, uh, starting to make those fields back into world climate. So thinking about just this lifespan of 250 years really got me thinking about how we can anchor 
stories in different life landscape features and starting with thinking about the mobilities of the, this landscape. So just thinking about the mobilities of the, the Gregs at the time when this tree was small. Now in, in mobilities research, which is the centre that I work with, we one of the key figures in that was called John Ory. And he sort of he often talked about sort of the 1840s as being the beginning of some of the modern mobilities that we have now, like the beginnings of say Thomas Cook setting up uh, modern tourism and the beginning of the camera and how the camera changed the way that we do tourism. Um, but the Gregs were involved in things like a grand tour, a commercial tour. Um, some, uh, uh, Robert Hyde Gregg did a commercial tour and a, a tour of Europe um, as when he was entering into beginning to start, just before he started to kind of get involved in the mill. Um, they, were, they owned a uh, plantation that was um, uh, with enslaved people on the plantation. They um, were involved in, obviously, in shipping cotton to the UK. So all these things about global trade and these mobilities of people and goods um, and um, uh, even importing of trees for the rhododendrons for the grounds here, so even the importing of live materials, um, they were involved in those kinds of mobilities way back um, in the late 1700s and early 1800s, right at the beginning of... of uh, kind of explosion of those mobilities that in some ways has led us to where we are now with, with climate emergency, that the, this explosion of mobility of travel around the world, of shipping things around the world with such ease that we barely think about that, that as being a, a, an issue. So that was my way into the whole project. Um, and just a couple of little bits from, from a couple of videos. This one is, is to do with the meadows, and I was um, the, the I was given some meadow seeds that are similar to the ones that are similar mix to what they're using to reseed the meadows here. And I started to grow those and I photographed them over about eight weeks. And then trained an artificial uh, and machine learning software with all of those photographs and photographs of the production book here from Quarry Bank. And it started to make these models of things growing that both seem to zoom into the kind of detail of tiny bits of grass but it also you can see this gridding it starts to make the agriculture like the production book so it learnt the grid of the ledger and it applied it to the grass instead so the grass starts to become this kind of uniform thing rather than an organic growth and the video I hope has this sense of a kind of battle between organic growth and a more regimented almost like sort of rows of agricultural planting um, and it sort of battles with the ledger, which I sort of think of the, the, the idea of sort of um, exploitative mass production um, and just the will to make as much profit and produce as much as is possible, um, that, that is almost like a battle between of the meadow and the agricultural um, piece of land. And then this video, um, which is um, just a still from it, but there's also um, the video in the show, which I took thousands of photographs of the moss and lichen around the site, and then photographs of the wage book, um, uh, thousands of photographs of the pages of the wage book with the names of the workers. And those two things um, sort of entangle with each other. I think of it less as a fight and more of their, their kind of entangled with each other um, in, in that video. And part of what I wanted to do was to try to show, in a way, how the human lives and the natural environment are so closely entangled together in, in the, the sort of futures of that, that landscape. Um, and even thinking about the piece that John's just been talking about, um, the sphagnum moss, um, when it, it, part of its, its cycle of life and death, eventually um, makes peat, um, which is a great sort of um, carbon um, sequestration and um, thinking about the way in which the industri during the Industrial Revolution um, the clouds of pollution from Manchester were blown over the peat district and when the acid rain fell it killed a lot of that sphagnum moss that was creating the peat on the walls there and so, so the, the human involvement in the life and death of peat bogs um, I hope comes across a bit in the way that they're entangled together in some of these videos. 
so and a lot of a lot of loss. So how can we reclaim some some of our imagination about a possible better future? I'm going to talk about a little bit the carbon landscape, which is basically the landscape between Manchester and Liverpool, and trying to link up the sort of the, this this post-industrial landscape with the landscape that fueled the industrial revolution, and is is, is a landscape of quite a lot of division and loss, really, and. What we found in the early stages of this project, project back in about 2013, that we, this, this wasn't really seen as a unified landscape. There were little patches of biodiversity, but it wasn't joined up. And what we did with the carbon landscape project was to really think about how we could link up across this landscape and actually come up with an, it, 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 a whole new view of that landscape, of this space of post-extraction, to really think through how can we actually link these sites up and make this an amazing green space for nature and people. And what the, the, through this imagination, plus an awful lot of hard work and volunteering, they able to go from peat extraction with the drainage to blocking that up and actually starting to see this becoming a carbon sink. From a, this is Bickershaw, shut down in 1992, to the beginnings of nature recovery, to an actual, now it's a thriving landscape, and there's bitterns flying across this, and it's actually a habitat for willow tits, and a huge area of natural flood management holding that water on the landscape. So we've seen this incredible story of nature's recovery from the dereliction of mines to now what has actually become the first post-industrial urban nature reserve, which is going to be declared on Monday for the Wing and Flashes, which is a really extraordinary story from this sort of desolation to the first urban post-industrial nature reserve, in part thanks to the willow tit. It's so rare, and it happens to like the very scrubby landscape that's been left behind. So this is a combination of some machinery changing, thinking about the landscape, how do we actually take that mining and that sort of and change the landscape. Plus, of course, the people with knowledge on that landscape, the land managers, the people that know that actually, well, you know what, there's a drain over there, and if you do this here, then there's, you're going to lose water over there. And people who actually work on that landscape. Plus, thousands and thousands of volunteers who have been out counting, um, looking at, planting seeds, thinking about how they can actually engage with that landscape. Where do people walk? How can we get people interested? It's a combination of all of those, but it took a massive feat of the imagination to actually think about how to turn something like this, which is new moss wood, rough grassland, into something that could actually become a moss land again. So a bit of machinery, a little bit of rethinking of the hydrology, a little bit of planting of seeds, and it's now an extraordinary landscape where you're seeing the reintroduction of the Manchester August butterfly, which went extinct 150 years ago. And my role in this has been to thinking about the community, community and stakeholder engagement, how you bring people together, partnerships, and actually help them think, what do we already have? What do we care about? What's good? And what can we imagine into the future? How can we actually imagine a future that is sustainable? So that's been my role in all of this, to really think about how we brought people together, but thinking as a slight bigger, bigger picture over longer time frames understanding that this is the design system basically the industrial revolution and almost all of our actions at the moment where we overwhelm with natural stuff we poison with things that don't belong and we destroy the very ecosystems we rely on the bad news this is what we're doing the good news is though if you understand that this is actually the only three ways we can mess up the ecosystem the natural systems we rely on we could design things that did the opposite that actually restored ecosystems balanced our flows of natural material by living off solar energy and made sure that anything that didn't belong in nature was kept in the right loop. We could have all the nature and the culture, all the culture we want existing with nature if we change our imagination, if we change the way we think about what, how we build our buildings, how we design our systems. So the Carbon Landscape Project is the first project that I'm aware of where we've actually been in teaching this big picture view of sustainability to the community members, to the schools, to the stakeholders, to the mayor of Salford, um, playing games with the round view to actually think about how we could reimagine this landscape and do this in a way that built skills and make people think about the future differently. And we've been doing this within set and here's workshop at the National Trust where we started to think about this in, I think we think there's about 20, 
14, wasn't it, this, I think, uh, these workshops where we were starting to think about, maybe a little bit later, but it wasn't much, it wasn't far off, was it? Starting to think about how you imagine this global story of sustainability from the first life to the first footsteps on land to actually the first art, the, the how we think about our story in the global system, but turning that into a place, into a particular place, and thinking how do we tell that story in this particular place of where it got to be, where it is now, and what we want to see in the future. So this we were trialing in the Carbon Landscape Project, and then we used this very story of the ancient history of the global story of sustainability in a local place and this lens of the round view, the three ways we can do harm and the three ways we need to actually redesign systems. That's what we use to actually interrogate the archives of the Quarry, of Quarry Bank and John Milan's library to help, influ to help inspire some of the thinking for this exhibit here. And in fact, all of these games that you see at the end all came out of this work of trying to find ways of making the round view into the fourth R, reading, writing, arithmetic, and the round view. So we all ask a simple set of questions about what we can do to make things more sustainable, and we can all make better decisions. So this is really exciting that this has all been, work has been carried out here, and is now being picked up by UNESCO UK, with um, trials in the Scottish Planning Centre, and looking at the, how we can use these games and this way of thinking in some of, to use the convening power of places like the National Trust, like World Heritage Sites, that people come to to help reimagine and rethink different futures. So it's very exciting. Of course, there's a journal article, so I'm happy to share that. Loads of and, and more coming hopefully soon. But much more exciting, I think, is the fact that tonight we actually have the world premiere of the new timeline graphic that actually sets this story in place. So, so this, this, is, this is really is a, a kind of a collaboration of artists and sort of working with an artist that really brought in the science and doing this, telling this story in such a way that we actually try and rethink how it is that we, how we can imagine the future, learning from the past, learning from the deep past of billions of years, the millions of years, the thousands of years, and this blink of an eye of geological time, in which we, time we've actually started causing these unintended consequences in the first place. So that's sort of what I'm doing. My mission is to turn this, like I say, into the fourth R and get it so that everybody is asking these questions, but using that to inspire change in the landscape.